Aloha. Welcome to Finding Your Piece of the Rock on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Abe Lee. I have been a licensed real estate agent since 1973. I'm the owner of Century 21 I Properties Hawaii and work with close to 100 wonderful agents in real estate sales. I started AB seminars in 1980. I have taught over 11,500 students to help them get their real estate licenses and have taught continuing education classes for licensees to renew their licenses every two years. Our show is dedicated to helping buyers and sellers understand the process involved in a real estate transaction. Our special guests will talk about legal issues, escrow, title, getting a loan, surveys, home inspections, insurance, contracts, wounds and trusts, and much, much more. Today, we're especially privileged to have a terrific architect and a planner, and his name is Phil Camp. So, Phil, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Abe. My pleasure. Now, I met Phil several years ago because he took my real estate class. And I knew he wasn't a, a regular realtor to be. So I said, Phil, what are you doing in this class? He said, well, I just wanted to know more about real estate because I'm an architect. That's how we got to be friends and have gone to lunch every once in a while. And we see each other at business meetings. So I thought, I'm going to have Phil on my show because he's got some really interesting things about his work and how it affects housing. So Phil, tell us a little background about your where you grew up and your education and how you got involved in architecture. Sure, Abe, I'd love to. I, a, a little bit, I know it doesn't look like it, but I am a local boy, uh, born and raised here, uh, went to school at Iolani, uh, went away to <clears throat> go to school in the mainland at USC, and then I uh, had a good opportunity to work several places before I, I came back home, worked abroad in uh, uh, Singapore, and then uh, probably about a decade in, in Los Angeles, uh, working on large-scale mixed-use multi-family projects up and down the West Coast uh, before coming back home uh, to bring that experience back to our local market. Um, and then the, the other thing that's uh, fairly unique that maybe not everybody knows uh, about me and, and our, our practice is, uh, aside from being born and raised here, I, I grew up in the construction trade. So our family uh, owns and operates the largest scaffolding insurance company in the state of Hawaii as well, at the sales. Uh, so ever since I could drive <laughs> in high school, I was on job sites delivering scaffolding and shoring. So uh, it, it helps bring a unique perspective when we're designing projects because uh, I don't just look at it as an architect, but I think about how our contractor partners are going to have to build it and, and support it and then, uh, and then how our owner partners are going to have to maintain it and look after it uh, when we're done. So, um, yeah, we're, we're very fortunate on uh, both sides of the uh, of the coin, as you might say, uh, coupled into our experience profile. Oh, that's great. And besides that, your brother is, the, I guess, the president of the scaffolding company, who I've met once or twice. But your sister-in-law, she's really famous in the <laughs> real estate uh, lending business. Kathy yeah, Kapp. Kathy's at uh, CPB these days. So both my brothers uh, run the day-to-day -day operation for our scaffold operation. I I'm still a equal partner, but I'm not on the day-to-day -day ops. Obviously, I have my <laughs> hands filled uh, doing architecture. But uh, sure. yeah, we were, we're very uh, fortunate to have uh, some, well, everybody other than me, maybe Akamai uh, family members, <laughs> members that are uh, understand uh, design and the construction sure. industry. And your wife is also a partner with you. So she has her own uh, claim to fame in her field of business. She she is. Uh, she's my partner uh, in more ways than one, but she's a very valued partner for hierarchy. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, from Southern California, that, that's where I met her. Um, so her, her family, which is a, a partnering team to our team here in Honolulu, uh, she grew up doing a lot of mixed use, um, but more specifically, a lot of civic and industrial uh, institutional buildings of schools, uh, a lot of things that engage with the community. So we really make a pretty unique combo where I do a lot of the mixtures, multifamily and office industrial. She'll do the civic, institutional and, and, and public, public outreach and engagement. So helps make a well-rounded uh, team when we uh, try to help our client partners. Great. Now, as I looked at your website, <clears throat> you talked about focusing on sustainability and the importance of ongoing education 
to be able to use these tools and resources to benefit each project, large projects and their impact on the housing market. So can you amplify on that? On the sustainability front? Well, yes, and the importance of ongoing education. Yeah, all, all of it, I mean, as you know, education is a huge part of what you do. I, I was fortunate enough to uh, participate in your class, learned a lot. I always look at it as uh, putting more tools in my toolbox. So uh, not just understanding um, fee and title ownership and, uh, you know, because we have unique real estate roles here in Hawaii. And even though I was born and raised here, it's always good to know more about it so I can help our uh, local partners. Um, but on the sustainability front, I, you know, we just think it's really important uh, you know, we're born here, I live here, and I don't plan on going anywhere. So, you know, how our design impacts our community is it's really important to us. You know, a lot of other teams, and not the local teams, but say a, a mainland team, if they're not focused about in Hawaii, they don't live here, they may not care so much about the impact. Um, but we absolutely think about how our buildings will impact our community later on. So being an island in the middle of the Pacific, energy is a huge uh, issue and sustainability really digs into energy energy consumption, but not just uh, energy consumption, just how a building uh, with, withstands its uh, longevity. So are, are you gonna be continually maintaining it or ripping it apart to make it operable? Or uh, are you thinking about those things as you move forward? So uh, similar to your class, I, I took it upon myself to become a LEED certified professional. So for those who are familiar with LEED, it's a leadership in energy design. Um, so I usually look at that as kind of the bricks and sticks of design. I'm also a well-certified professional. So well is uh, related to health and wellness. So where lead focuses on bricks and sticks, uh, well focuses on the people and the occupants within. So, you know, us humans. And then uh, I'm also a certified energy manager and a certified construction manager. So to our GC partners, I'm always looking at, you know, they have a huge, a huge hand in delivering good projects, right? We can design the greatest thing, but if we don't understand how our uh, contractor partners are going to bring these projects to life, um, it, it doesn't help our design. So I took it upon myself to understand the construction management side of that equation as well, so we can really help our client partners deliver. Now, let's talk about lead because people, some people in the industry know what lead is. In fact, I've taken classes on lead because I was interested in how do you create energy efficient buildings? But tell us more about what's involved in getting a LEED certified building and also a well certified building. Because I have not heard of well until I saw your website. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so, uh, LEED, you know, generally the overarching umbrella for LEED is the United States Green Building Council. Um, the founding member, the person who really was uh, representative of starting LEED was Rick Fedrizzi. He broke off and started the Well Initiative, and so they're very similar, um, part and parcel, due to Rick Fitrizzi's kind of presidency and leadership in setting both of those uh, groups up. As far as going through certification processes, uh, typically you have a lead certified professional, so, such as myself or, or the general contractor, or even the owner, um, and then you're pursuing a certification uh, process as you go through design and construction. Uh, the process will entail uh, prerequisites. So there's certain things that you have to do, uh, just kind of baseline criteria. And then there's a scoring chart that allows you to accrue <clears throat> additional points. So you could be LEED certified uh, baseline certification, uh, silver, gold, or or platinum uh, is the highest level from a LEED perspective of certification. And really it just elevates the benchmark of sustainability. It's not just uh, energy uh, conservation. There's you know, natural daylighting, because uh, the amount of natural daylight that gets into a space uh, impacts how people operate. It talks about air quality. Um, that was a huge issue uh, that really people are starting to take interest in after COVID. Um, water turbidity or the cleanliness of the water that you consume, you know, most people thought that was, didn't make any sense and nobody wanted to hear about it. But then you heard about Flint, Michigan, and then our own close to home, Red Hill, you know, it really impacts people. Um, so the, the spaces we design and, and build um, absolutely have an impact on, uh, you know, how you live. And then from a well perspective, that's the health and wellness of the people. There's this rule that we talk about. It's called the 330-300 rule. And the general premise is you spend about $3 a square foot <clears throat> um, on utilities, about $30 a square foot 
on rent and by far and away, and this is related to office buildings, but by far and away in any uh, structure or any business, the most important and costly are the people. And that you spend about $300 a square foot. So when you're looking at things and if you're saying, hey, I want to conserve energy, that's great. We're all for that. But that's turning the, the that's the $3 a square foot now, right? But if you can increase the health and wellness of a building um, and make it better for the occupants, uh, reduce sick days, make them more attentive when they are here, you know, at work, um, that's turning that $300 a square foot now. So if you can improve the user interface and, and just the... Um, the work experience of your employees, it's it's there's absolute uh, economic returns on that. So that's where the well component comes in is focusing on the people. So now you think there's a gradation system. You're talking about silver, gold, and platinum. Um, how many buildings that are being built, say in Hawaii or on the mainland, would hit that platinum level versus say silver or gold? It, I mean, it really do you have any numbers? Ooh, I, I wouldn't have, have numbers. So uh, it, it also depends on what market you're working. So for instance, uh, you know, for a long time and, and still in some of the federal markets, uh, so government projects, military projects, uh, NAFAC and the such, um, for a long time, they had a baseline standard that all their buildings had to be at least lead silver, I, I believe. Um, so, you know, if you were looking in that sector, it'd be 100% of the projects for a time. Uh, it's not necessarily the case in all sectors of the government. Uh, and then also as you move through the U.S., there's different areas or, or globally, because it's not a U.S. centric uh, uh, platform. It's it's international, Hong Kong, Europe, all over the place. Uh, but if, if you use U.S. as an example, there's certain markets that will have more lead certified projects and it resonates with the buyer or the occupant or the building owner. And there's other markets where it doesn't really register and maybe there's not as much value. So there's a perceived value um, which might resonate in your market, say a single family home buyer, if they don't know what lead certification is, they're not going to pay any more for it, uh, even though it means the building's healthier, right? But in a market where it's widely recognized and they know it's a, a certificate that, that confirms that that building is in fact a higher level of sustainability, uh, in a market that's well recognized, they'll pay for it, right? Um, so it, it really depends. I don't know if that's a long-winded way of saying, I, I can't give you a firm answer, but it depends on which market you're in and which locality you're in. Um, and it, like I said, like if you're in a government market where it's required, then 100% of those projects will be lead certified. Um, in, in other markets, uh, maybe not so much. But even like say Howard Hughes, that's a big part of their deliverable uh, requirements. So if you look at most of the Howard Hughes projects in Kakako, they have a pretty high level of lead certification, a lot of platinum and gold projects uh, on their their portfolio where other development teams may not have that lead criteria. Um, so they, they, and, or they're not as interested in pursuing it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's important to their core mission. So they have a lot of. Well, I know that um, large residential developments, developers like say Gentry or Kathleen Cook or Ho Pili, Lee, don't, do they have some sort of lead certification for their buildings? Uh, some some of the developers do. Um, like I mentioned, Howard Hughes certainly does. Uh, some of the other um, uh, production builders, maybe not so much. Um, and then there's other instances, like say, uh, say you're doing 201H project, affordable housing projects, the state will mandate uh, or request um, uh, sustainable certification of some sort. Typically, LEED is usually the most recognized. And if you're competing, competing, sorry, for subsidized dollars or tax benefits, and all the developers are in that market, uh, if you can deliver a project that's really sustainable, it has a high level of lead certification, you're more likely to win those tax dollars than say a project that doesn't. So you'll see a lot of 201H projects that are lead certified. So our uh, Hill Hole Lane, for instance, that was an affordable rental in Kakako, 201H project uh, was a lead platinum project that helped us um, you know, achieve 2-1-H approval. Our uh, Kolapua affordable housing project in Princeville also lead platinum. So, you know, we really looked at the sustainability concept to help curry favor with the state because the state wants to incentivize a uh, high level of sustainability for their uh, occupants. If they're going to be paying and helping to fund these projects, uh, they, you know, they want projects that are going to last a long time. They're not going to be a draw on the energy grid and consume a ton of energy 
Um, so they're looking at the long game, right? I went to a seminar uh, a few days ago, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, and the speaker was talking about how they were looking at even recycling the brown water. And then, of course, making the building energy efficient by the way they uh, directed where the wind flow was going to be mm -hmm. and to reduce the air conditioning requirements or whatever. So you folks think about all that while you're build designing? That, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, especially, and it's somewhat of a misnomer because, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't have lead uh, certified projects in affordable housing because it increases the cost. And, you know, and that, that's really a misnomer. If you're thinking about it from the onset, um, you know, it can be a real benefit. So, for instance, that Coho Coal project I mentioned was a lead platinum project we designed. We intentionally located and allocated windows in that project as it rotated across the site. And we looked at the wind pattern so that those buildings uh, could all be passively ventilated. So no AC. Right. So, and they're still cool when they're occupied. So, you know, when you ask someone that needs affordable housing, what's the best thing about affordable housing? It's that it's affordable. But if you go design a, a you know low cost solution that is so hot and miserable that they need to run AC all the time, it no longer is affordable. Right. They, their rent might be low, but they're paying a huge energy premium just to keep the place um, livable. So we absolutely look at that, and I think that that has to be part of your um, affordable housing project. But at any level, um, if you can reduce energy and make it more comfortable, make that user experience a better one, um, and not depend on energy to do that, um, you know, that's, that's a that's a great solution. So so yes, we absolutely look at that uh, in all of our projects, whether they're affordable or not. Okay, so now Phil, amazingly, half the time's gone already, and so we only have half left. And it's a fascinating market, but you talked about for affordable housing for doing larger projects that is actually more cost effective when you have a higher density. And then it's going to cost less per square foot. And the people, you have more people that can live in Hawaii and not have to go to the mainland, as we call it, the brain drain. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk about one of your projects that you've done on a residential? How long did it take to get the entitlements? And then to get the permits, and then to finish the project out. Yeah, so I'm asking a good question, and, and you know, <clears throat> the answer is it varies, obviously, um, and it depends. You know, typically when you're talking about entitlements, you're talking about getting land classified uh, for new use. So, say something like a coal ridge or something like that. You know, those guys are working through that entitlement long before the, the final architects are are really engaged um, in working with land planners and attorneys. Because in that case, you're changing a use from, say, uh, ag land to uh, a different zoning. Uh, in the case of, say, a Keoho Lane, most of the entitlements are there, or in fact, that was an urban infill project. So the zoning was already there, but we still had to go through what might loosely be qualified as entitlements, really more uh, zoning approvals, because that was a 201H project. Um, and in that 201H process, um, we were looking for an increased densities to, to allow more units uh, and then a reduction in parking. So we didn't have to provide as much parking that wasn't necessary. So a lot of times your baseline code would require a certain amount of parking. Let's say in the case of Keohole Lane, we're immediately adjacent to a TOD stop. And even before the transit stop gets there, there's bus stops all around and it's in the center of Kakako. So the reality is people living there can walk and bike to just about anywhere they need. So building a ton of parking, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that's a good project where we reduce the parking below the code, code requirement, and they still don't use all the parking in that building. So that's a great example because it's so uh, centrally located. And when the transit gets there, you would think it's going to reduce even further, right? So that that stop has yet to be built, but there's still tons of bus and walking and biking opportunities, and you can walk to downtown from that that location. So now, I know in our notes as we prepare for this um, interview, you said some entitlements could take one to 15 years. Yeah, so that might be more like a coal ridge or whole feeling. You know, these are master plan developments, right? So they have to go through a ton of approval processes up front. Um, and we're talking, you know, hundreds of acres of land and massive infrastructure projects with roadways, freeway off-ramps, uh, sewer provisioning, 
water, power, all of that stuff. Um, so it, when you think about the undertaking that has happened before you even look at designing one single unit, I mean, it's a big undertaking, right? Uh, so those those are the ones that you maybe take 10 to 15 years because there's so much that has to happen before you get to the first dwelling unit. On the, say, an urban infill product like Gale Lane or those Hubbard Hughes projects or any of the vertical towers in downtown, the infrastructure is there, the roadways are there, the sewer is there, water power is there, and the zoning is generally um, accepting of the use that you're, you're planning or designing towards. So that that sort of entitlement is different. That's more just uh, getting your final approvals. Um, so when you're talking about 10, 15 years, that's a huge project that you know, you're, you're going into, uh, you know, so like Hope Peely, that was uh, sugar before that became a project, right? So you're, you're moving from acres and acres and acres of sugar cane to building out and designing the required infrastructure for an entire community. So all the sewer, all the water, all the power, all of those things have to happen. And that, that's a big and heavy lift and costly lift that, that has to happen before you get to your first residential unit. Well, I've read on some of these larger projects, these developers had to go to court to, uh, you know, basically win over the ones that were opposing it, saying, we don't want this project. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, you're adding several years and added costs Absolutely. to the project. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge deal. I mean, the, the, the NIMBY acumen not in my backyard, you know, we try to replace that with the YIMBY, so yes, in my backyard. Um, you know, and there's always that stigma about uh, additional traffic, uh, additional outsiders coming to your community. Um, and that's where we, we think TOD, transit-oriented uh, design and development is important because it's providing the infrastructure for smart growth. So instead of building a community, you know, say way out on the fringes of, of the island and all those people have to drive all the way uh, to downtown to get a job, uh, if you can develop and increase the density around a transit stop and increase the infrastructure for uh, sewer, water, and power, uh, you know, to get those people moving back and forth is way more efficient. So that's where we talk about the, the economy of scale from a bigger project, a vertical project. I mean, you can imagine if you have 500 units and they're stacked vertically versus 500 units that sprawl out across, you know, 50 acres, every one of those dwelling units in 50 acres would require a sewer line and a HECO line and a water line going to every one of those houses. But if you're stacking it vertically, all of that infrastructure is dramatically uh, reduced. Um, so you can quickly see how that economy of scale really helps and it makes good sense when you're really trying to increase density and deliver affordable housing. So now the entitlements is that once to 15 years, now how long does it take to get a permit for, let's say a high rise? Yeah, that, that's a that's a that's a somewhat of a, of a weighted question, Abe. I know you like to put me on the spot with these tough <laughs> ones, but uh, no, no, all kidding aside, it it really depends on where the project is. So if the project is already entitled, you know, you're not looking for a zone use change or any of those kinds of things. Um, you know, you can probably for a bigger project, you probably from soup to nuts, going I would say sixteen months to two and a half years. Now that's from submitting or starting to having an actual permit. Uh, but every project has other opportunities to expedite that. So you know, one of the things we typically do, and this comes from a lifetime of experience working on big projects in, in Los Angeles, we used to do the same thing. We'd break the project apart. So we'd do foundation only permits and then vertical project permits. Same building, but we could focus and get the foundation only permit release first, maybe say in six months or four to five months. And with that foundation only permit, the contractor uh, can start that foundation work. So sometimes that foundation work, auger cast piles and all the uh, un underground utilities and infrastructure foundations, that could take four months, five months on a, on a big project. You know, maybe, maybe three months, but it, depending on how complicated the infrastructure and underground foundations are. So during that time, they're actually out there working and then you'll get the permit for the vertical tower. And then even on the vertical tower, there's ways to expedite that. If you get through most of your plan check and uh, permitting process and at least complete the first round without any major issues hanging out there, like say infrastructure or service capability, uh, you can pursue an SAI. So it's a special assignment inspection. 
and that would allow work on the tower to start before the permit is finally finalized and realized. So there's there's a lot of ways to, to tackle it if you have the right team. Um, you know, it's it's a little more complicated, but those big projects aren't easy. They, they take a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of time. Okay, now we're down to the last three minutes, Phil. Can you believe okay. it? Yeah. Now let me ask you. Your job as an architect, once a building starts, <clears throat> you're involved in every phase of what happens, like the concrete's poured, the building's framed, and all the in internal stuff. Your job must be huge in inspecting that the building is being built according to your design. No, it is. I mean, that's a huge part. That's probably one that I take, uh, well, I wouldn't say most seriously, because I very much care about the design and the early phases, but... Having grown up in the trades, you know, uh, I, I, like I said, I grew up as soon as I could drive, uh, you know, get a license. I was driving our forklift and our tractor trailers and delivering scaffolding around the island. So, um, you know, I understand what our construction partners are going through. So I try to be a big part. I try to go out and help them and I understand that, you know, that there's not too many architects. I had a comment from Dredging on uh, one of our projects, like, you're the only architect I've ever seen climb scaffolding. <laughs> you know, so we're ex ex inspecting the exterior uh, windows and the and the if sweeps and the drainage. But yeah, but we also have to lean on our construction partners because they're out there day to day, every day, and they're doing their own quality control and quality assessment. Um, so we're just an added oversight to that. But we we do take it seriously. It's not. Uh, we, we don't just hope for the best because uh, there's so much that goes on in, in the construction process and to deliver a great product, the more hands, you know, uh, the lighter the lift. Yeah, you certainly don't want buildings to cram come crashing down like the one in Florida no, where the whole condominium no. just went down. Yeah, no, that's uh, that was a horrible, horrible story for sure. I think some of that was, uh, in, in fairness to the, their, their design community, I think a lot of that had to do with deferred maintenance. And that's a big part of every building as well. You know, I mean, when you go through home inspections, you, you see the same two homes, same age, one's taken care of well and one's not. It, it, it's like two different buildings. If, they, if you don't maintain a building, it's a living, breathing organism, right? So uh, imagine if you didn't take care of your health uh, for 50 years, right? It would be, be a problem for sure. So you know, people really, you know, um, that, that operations and maintenance phase, and that's what we think about when we're designing to make the operations and maintenance viable. Because uh, if you can't maintain a building, no matter how beautiful it is, it's not going to last. Well, Phil, I just got the word that time's up. So <laughs> thank you so much. No Phil problem. is with High RK LLP. And if you look up his website, you can see a lot of the work that he's done. Very extensive and very interesting, very diverse. So look up Phil, he's a great guy and really easy to talk to. And I really enjoy sitting down with him and having lunch or breakfast or whatever. So thank you so much, Phil. And those of you that want to look at the video later, please tell your friends about this wonderful uh, interview. And if you're interested in learning more about seminars, real estate classes, go to ableseminars.com and I teach those classes. So thank you so much, Phil. Appreciate your time. And I appreciate your uh, making the time to be with us today. No, thank you so much, Ava. I appreciate it. I always love talking about affordable housing and, and, and working in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, folks. See you later. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, Please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.